Hi everyone, welcome to our Lynx webinar today. This is Making the Pieces Fit, Identifying and Boosting the Integrated Skills Addressed in a Transitions-Minded Lesson. We have two guest presenters with us today who we'll introduce in just a minute. Um, so this is hosted through Lynx, which is a professional development website from sponsored by the, the United States Department of Education. Um, it's a great resource for adult educators with lesson plans, activities. We do a lot of these different sorts of webinars and discussions. Uh, it's a great place if you haven't been there before, check it out. It's links.ed.gov. You can create a free account and get access to those materials right away. Um, we have a few reminders for today. So at the end of the webinar, there's a survey to fill out. I'm going to post the link to the survey in our chat box in a few minutes. Please be sure to do that at the end of the webinar. We have, and so please notice that we do have a chat feature. If you have questions for the presenters, feel free to send the questions through the chat box. We'll be answering a few um, as we go through the, through the webinar today. We'll also be answering a few on the community of practice on links in the coming days. So please use that feature. We've also got a few handouts that you can download and that we'll be taking a look at through the webinar. So please take a look at those. Um, click those to download and open those up and uh, keep those handy for the webinar. I'm going to turn it over to Susan Finn Miller. She's, the, she's one of our uh, community of practice moderators on Lynx and she will introduce the topic and our presenters today. Thank you, Megan, and warm welcome to everyone this afternoon. We're delighted that you've joined us for this webinar. So I'm, I have the great pleasure of introducing Stephanie Summers and Heather Turngren, which you see their lovely faces here on the slide. And Stephanie has worked in adult education for over 15 years. She has extensive experience designing and delivering effective, engaging professional development in both face-to-face -face and online formats. And her colleague, Heather Turngren, has worked in adult education with the Minneapolis Adult Education since the year 2000, when she earned her Master's of Ed in Education in Adult Basic Education lic Licensure from the University of Minnesota. She also coordinates Career Pathways curriculum for Minneapolis and is an Atlas consultant. So we have some wonderful, very experienced presenters this afternoon. I wanted to um, invite everyone to the follow-up discussion after today's webinar, which will begin tomorrow in the Teaching and Learning Community of Practice on Links. So I'm sure that many of you will want to join in that discussion. So I'm gonna turn it over to our presenters and we certainly welcome them and we um, wanna thank them for their willingness to share their expertise today. Stephanie and Heather. Thank you, Susan, for that great introduction. This is Heather Turngren and I'm sitting next to my colleague, Stephanie Summers. Hello, this is Stephanie Summers. And as uh, Susan pointed out, Heather and I both work for a large um, adult education program in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We are an urban school district. Um, we serve, our program serves about 500 learners um, a year at, 5, 000, at, I think. at about 5,000, pardon me, learners a year, spread over two different large, um, large program sites. Um, our learners are, have the opportunity to get a lot of instruction each week. Generally, our classes are held Monday through Friday. We offer about four hours of instruction each morning or about 20 hours a week. And then we offer three to four hours in the evening So our and, and Monday through Thursday. So our evening classes, about 16 hours of instruction weekly. So a lot of time that we spend with our learners and we are hoping to pass on some of the things that we've learned through working with our wonderful learners today with all of you. So welcome and again we would like to point out that we do have the chat box available so any questions or ideas that you want to share with your colleagues we are more than happy to have you do that. Okay, we're going to go through our objectives for today's uh, webinar. The first one is we're hoping to analyze one transitions-minded resource to identify what transition skills it would support. And for anyone who's not 
100% clear on what we mean by transitions minded and transition skills. Heather's going to talk about that in just a moment. Our second objective is to better understand how other ABE programs around the country support transitions minded instruction. And to do that, we're really going to be hoping to open up some conversation using the chat box. So we'd like all of you to share some of your experience with this topic as well. We're going to identify at least three new resources for classroom use, again, related to building those transition skills. And then we're going to build an integrated skill lesson that incorporates the four sets of skills that we know our adult learners need to really be successful. So those are our basic skills like basic literacy and math, digital literacy and soft skills. The fourth is sort of that specific career knowledge or content knowledge that applies to specific areas. And we'll get into that in a, a little while when we unpack our lesson. Yes, and just to describe what we have in mind when we talk about transitions, it could be for any level of student, and it's just transitioning students to their next steps, and that could be transitioning to employment, transitioning to training, transitioning to a post-secondary educational opportunity. So the idea of transitions is not just left for the learners as they transition into a college setting, but we are actually preparing our learners to be transitioning at every point within their educational pathway. Excellent. So Heather's going to talk a little bit about what mindset, what do we mean when we talk about mindset? So today, the lesson, the resource we're going to look at has to do with growth mindset. There are a lot of different topics that are very important um, to the transitions classroom. And mindset is just one that um, we've been thinking about and talking a lot about here in our home state of Minnesota. And so the resource, the specific lesson that we look at today is related to growth mindset. So Heather will talk a little bit about what that means. Thank you, Stephanie. And another reminder is in the handouts, you can actually download the lesson plan that we're going to be unpacking and some other of the other resources and materials that go along with this webinar. If you look on your screen, you can see on the left this idea of a fixed mindset. And that is the belief that some people have that intelligence is a fixed trait, like your eye color, that you really can't change. Okay, yes, you could change your eye color if you bought colored contacts, but you can't change the color of your eyes. If you look on the right side, this is that sort of growth mindset idea. And that is the belief that the intelligence that we all have can be developed just like a muscle. We go to the gym to work out. Well, we have to create that sort of gym for our brain so that we are always developing that um, intelligence and that muscle. We're going to be looking more at the growth mindset and perhaps having your students who might be in the fixed mindset move towards that growth mindset that will enhance their learning and other opportunities. Okay, so why is mindset important? A lot of the research in the area of mindset was done by a woman named Carol Dweck, D-W-E-C-K, and she is a researcher and professor at Stanford University. And she wanted to know why some students seemed to do better in school, while others tended to not flourish, especially when they were facing challenging coursework or when maybe they'd been given a bad test score. Some seemed to give up while others seem to use that as an opportunity to ask good questions and move forward with a better set of tools. So she looked into, um, she started studying this and what characteristics these two groups of learners had, and that led to eventually this theory of mindset. So there is a large body of research that supports the idea that students with a growth mindset do better in school. So again, we want our students moving towards growth. This is especially important when students are having to really push themselves um, in order to, to maybe reach a goal, or as we mentioned before, when they have felt like they've, they've 
hit a stumbling block. We don't want them giving up. We want them seeing that as an opportunity to grow and to build that mind muscle. Yeah, and so as we discussed earlier, there are those two different mindsets. So students, and these could be the learners in your classroom, may have that fixed mindset. They might just give up because they believe that they just don't get it, or math is just too hard, or I have students who say they don't have a good brain. They just can't do it. They don't want to ask for help. They might not show a lot of effort because they don't uh, want to be embarrassed for not understanding. They might fear that they don't look smart or they are not intelligent. However, we do know through research that students who have that growth mindset, they embrace or they are encouraged because of a challenge. They find it a way to develop. They understand it as what many in the educational field refer to as productive struggle. You may have heard this as the sort of grit that is needed. So we learn better when we have this productive struggle, when it's not just easily done, or we have someone else do it for us. So again, we would like to have our students move from perhaps what they might have, that fixed mindset, towards embracing and using that growth mindset. Right. And another uh, quick word on mindset is uh, we all have different mindsets and most of us can have maybe a fixed mindset in certain areas of our life and a growth mindset in others. So for myself, I think I have a growth mindset when it comes to my career as an educator. I always feel like I can learn and be, be doing better by learning new approaches to use with my students. I have more of a fixed mindset when it comes to athletic ability, for example. I, I feel like I've never been very good at athletics. I'm not a sporty person and therefore that's the narrative I believe about myself and I don't try very hard to get better in those areas. So people often have um, different mindsets depending on the situation. A good way to sum up growth mindset is with the word yet. So instead of believing you can't do something, a person with a growth mindset just adds the word yet onto the end of that sentence. I can't do it yet, or I don't understand it yet, because that yet leaves the door open to the possibility that you are going to grow and improve by trying a new approach or strategy. So we are thinking a lot of this will become more clear as we move through the lesson, and we hope that if you have any questions, again, you take advantage of that chat box feature. And Stephanie, I'm just going to point out that you don't have that athletic ability yet. <laughs> we'll go for a walk after this webinar, okay? Thanks, Heather. Okay, so the lesson that we are about to start looking at comes from a website called the Mindset Kit. And you can see at the bottom of the screen here, mindsetkit.org is where you could go to find this lesson. And then there is a drop down menu under where it says for teachers in that gray bar. And you would want to click on the teaching a growth mindset tab in order to access this lesson. However, for anyone who is intrigued by this idea of mindset, maybe it's something you've heard of, maybe this is the first time, but you want to learn more, coming to this website and exploring some of these other areas, such as how to celebrate mistakes or praising the process, not the person, these are other elements of growth mindset, and you might find some great resources here to help you learn more about this topic. But again, for today, we're going to be looking under teaching a growth mindset, and that's where we find this growth mindset lesson plan. You do not have to go on to the, out onto the internet to find it right now. It is in your handouts tab. So we have already uh, located it and, and attached it here for you. This would just be a place to go to get more information. And again, it's a great and wonderful resource. And what it's really, um, I think, important for ABE teachers to understand, it's 
there are free resources. We know that we have limited budgets, but if you can get free lesson plans and uh, usable materials for your classroom, it's another way that we can be sharing as colleagues. Let's take a look at this exploration of the lesson plan related to the growth mindset. So we're going to be looking at what sort of professional skills, some people call them soft skills, other people might call them essential skills that our learners need and pretty much everyone working in society today need. But these are skills that often ABE teachers need to be addressing within their classroom. And they might be the more difficult skills to address. You might be able to work on a math problem, but it might be difficult to address some of these soft skills, such as organization, time management, um, the kinds of things, problem solving, that we know our students lead, need, but they're not necessarily found just through doing problem solving, for example, or, you know, diagramming grammar points in, in a language arts class. Yeah, or completing a worksheet. This is more about perseverance in, uh, with a productive struggle to reach their goal. So this growth mindset plan, again, you can download it free and you can get it within the handouts. And the plan um, is in collaboration with Khan Academy. So the activities can be adapted to be able to use in many different levels of your classroom or if you have a multi-level classroom for both ELL, ABE, GED, for every aspect of adult basic education. Okay. So we're going to pause for just a moment and talk about what is meant when people talk about professional skills. As Heather, I think, said previously, professional skills, soft skills, employability skills, there's a lot of different names for these skills. And no matter what you call them, we know that they are essential to our students' future success. In our home state of Minnesota, we have developed a framework for teaching these skills that we call the Transitions Integration Framework, or the TIP. This framework was developed by looking at many other frameworks, such as Equip for the Future, 21st Century Skills, and doing kind of a survey of what already existed and trying to synthesize that information down to six essential categories of transition skills. We, each skill is defined and broken into sub-skills. And then there are also sample lesson ideas that are included with this framework. The, in your handout section, you will see something called the TIF, Tr Transitions Integration Framework at a Glance. That's sort of a short version of the document. Later on in this webinar, when we get to our resources, we will show you where you can find the full version of the TIF that includes those sample activity ideas as well as many other resources to support these skills. We have a curated resource library. New, new resources are added on a very regular basis to support the development of these skills. On the other side, next to the Transitions Integration Framework, you will see um, a picture of some resources that were developed by New World of Work. These are available online. These are free resources. They have done their own work at boiling down what are the most important professional or soft skills. They call them their top 10 21st century skills. You can see the list there. They also have a series of lessons and videos that can help teachers build these competencies with their learners. In, a, in addition to these two frameworks, many of you might be familiar with the OCTE employability skills framework. It's often represented as a wheel, and around that wheel there are seven or eight different categories, large areas of skills, and then those skills are broken down within the framework. There are also other frameworks. There's the Illinois Essential Employability Skills Framework. And if any of you know of professional or soft skills frameworks that you'd like to share, 
we would love to have you chat those out so we can add those to our own resource list. You might know of some that we are not aware of, so that would be great, uh, great sharing at this time. Yeah, and as Stephanie said, we have many different names for all of these frameworks, but it boils down essentially to the soft skills that students need to know and be able to do to be effective in a transitions environment. And again, that's transitioning to employment, to training, transitioning to post-secondary. So you can see a lot of these skills overlap um, and they uh, might have different names, but they all have the same ideas. So we hope that you will be able to work with us as we are more familiar with the TIF because it is one of our state uh, frameworks that we use within our classroom structures. Okay, pardon me. So in now we are going to look at, I believe, what is one more of the handouts from your handouts tab. So this is the skills identification chart. This is just a simple graphic organizer that we have developed for this webinar to help you keep track of the different skills as we move through this lesson. Because remember, the, the big idea of this webinar is building an integrated lesson that would address all the different skill areas that our students need to be successful. We know that our students need those professional soft skills. Those are the what we've just been talking about with those different frameworks. Our students also need basic or academic skills. Those are the kinds of skills that are taught in adult literacy classrooms, reading, writing, math, numeracy, science, social studies, those kinds of things are basic skills. Digital literacy skills are the, the technology skills that our students need to be successful. Things like using a computer, using the internet to do a search, being able to use a word processing program, being able to, um, to analyze a piece of information for validity, for example. We are going to show you another framework for those digital literacy skills, and you might be familiar with one that you're already using. And then the content-specific skills, that's kind of the other. Those are the things that come into a lesson specific to the topic or theme that you are addressing. So for ELL teachers, or English as a second language, or English for uh, speakers of other languages, those, those instructors, if you were doing a unit on community, for example, these content-specific skills might be the vocabulary that you would teach about the community places. It might also be a skill such as reading a map that you would use for this particular unit, but not just, it wouldn't transfer to any other unit, such as a healthcare unit, for example. So these are skills that come into play, usually vocabulary, and then when we get into doing more work skills, specific things that you would need to do to be successful within a particular area or context. Yeah, and again, we just developed this graphic organizer to help you as a teacher as it helps us when we plan our lessons. When I plan my lessons, I want to be incorporating soft skills. I want to be incorporating the basic academic skills. I want to be bringing in as much digital literacy skills and when possible, the content specific skills. That would make a really well-rounded lesson. Now there are days that my lesson might be just all about basic skills if I'm looking for the main idea. However, within a number of lessons, I want to be touching on all aspects of this graphic organizer to make a well-rounded lesson. So we would like you, if possible, to download this chart, the skills identification chart. As we go through the growth mindset lesson plan, we'll be using this identification chart so that you can know what skills you see within the lesson. We will be focusing mostly on the professional or soft skills, but we'll invite you to share the other skills that you might identify as we work through this lesson together. Please feel free to chat out any questions you might have or ideas on how you can share this lesson and some of the skills that you identify because we're all about sharing. 
Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So at this time, we are going to sort of dive into the lesson. This lesson is broken into three parts, and we're going to talk about each part and then pause and invite you to write your thoughts down on that graphic organizer about which skills would be addressed in each part of the lesson. Okay, so again, this is the lesson that can be downloaded from the website. It's also in your handouts tab. The first part of the lesson involves watching a video and then having a debrief, a discussion with your students. The lesson, the video is about the brain's malleability, malleability pardon. So the first part of helping our students develop a growth mindset involves convincing our students that this is possible, that their brains can change, and that, they are, that there is neurological scientific evidence behind the idea that by trying new approaches and by trying new strategies, we can grow our intelligence. So we need to get buy-in from our learners about this idea before we can really hope to have them develop growth mindsets themselves. So the first part of the lesson involves watching a short three-minute video and then having a conversation about what was talked about in that video. And the actual estimated time, that's for the whole first part of the lesson. The video, as you can see, is only a little over three minutes long. We are going to show you the video, but we also have a link here if you're able to uh, get it so that you could watch it later. And you can get the video link when you download the entire lesson plan. So if you bear with us for a moment, we're going to be switching our technology and we're going to be showing this YouTube video. What determines our intelligence? One school of thought is that, okay, maybe you're either just born with it or you either have it or you don't. Some people are smart, some people are less smart. Or maybe you can change it. And it turns out there's actually been a lot of research on this in the last few decades. And the answer is pretty clear that your intelligence can actually be changed. What we've learned, what researchers have taught us, is that our brains are actually a lot like a muscle. We know that you can grow your muscles by going into the gym and doing exercise and straining your muscles. You don't just work on things that are easy for your muscles to do. You do things that your muscles have to struggle with, that your muscles have to strain with, and then they rebuild themselves and they come back stronger. By struggling, it's a, it's a signal to your body to devote more resources to that part of the body. And we see that exact same thing with the brain. And here are just a couple of examples of it. This first one, this is, this is, this shows how the human brain develops in early childhood. This is a, a, a depiction of, of the, the, the neurons in a brain at birth. And then over as a child develops, it, it interacts with its environment. It tries things out. It struggles. It struggles to, to talk, to converse, to interact with folks, to understand the world around it. And as it struggles, you see that by age six, you have a much deeper and much stronger connectedness between the different neurons. Similarly, similarly, I can never say that word. This, these are depictions of, this is, these, these are the neurons of two different scenarios. This is the, the nerves of, of animals that were in unstimulating environments where they're not around other, other animals, they're in a bear cage. And then this is, this is the brain of an animal that is in a stimulating environment, that is constantly being challenged, that is constantly looking at stimulating new things. And so the big takeaway from this whole area of research is you absolutely can change your intelligence, that your brain is like a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it gets. And that the best way to grow it isn't to do things that are easy for you. That might help a little bit, but what really helps your brain is when you struggle with things. And it's actually research shows that your brain grows the most, not when you get a question right, but when you get a question wrong. So at least for me, this is incredibly exciting because it lets me know that when I'm going through something and I'm facing those times of maybe a little bit of adversity or a little bit of frustration, 
I can, I can, I can feel good about the fact that those are actually the times that I am growing the most. And it's, this isn't just something that I'm saying, nice words. Research tells us when you get something wrong, when you challenge your brain, when you review why you got it wrong, when you really process that feedback, that's when your brain grows the most. And that if you keep doing that, you're well on your way to having a stronger, more able, and I guess you could say smarter brain. All right, so we've just watched the video. Give us one second and we will return to our presentation here. And so we have just watched that video. And now we're going to pause for just a moment. And if you did not get a chance to, uh, to download this handout, maybe you could grab a piece of scratch paper that you have at hand or if you're taking notes, and if you could just quickly um, write down a few of the professional or soft skills that you think might be practiced by watching this video and then discussing it. And so we've watched the video and to remind you of what the questions are, these are the debriefing questions. So you can see the questions that the students would be prompted to discuss include, how do people become more intelligent? Intelligent. How does the diagram of the neurons at birth versus at age, age six demonstrate this? What about the second diagram of the nerves of the animal living in a cage versus an animal living with other animals and toys? How are our brains like muscles? And when do our brains grow the most? So again, if you think about having your students watch that video and then have this discussion, we'd like you to take the next two minutes, one to two minutes, and on your skills identification chart, we'd like you to write down a few of the soft or professional skills that you think you could help your students build through doing this first part of the lesson. And I'd like to say, I don't want you to get hung up if this video would be too difficult or complex for your learners to understand, or looking at the questions and how they are worded. These come directly from that lesson plan. And as we know, we're adult education specialists. We adapt a lot of curriculum, so you might have to adapt that video to meet your learners needs or the questions that are part of the lesson plan. So again, we're just going to focus with you as instructors and focus on the professional skills that you note from this lesson. We are going to take approximately 30 seconds to 40 seconds for you to think about them and we would like to encourage you to use your chat box to share any of those professional skills that you have noted. For those of you without a chat box, if uh, there is a way for you to possibly raise your hand, I'm not sure if that works in this particular webinar, but we would encourage you to chat with your colleagues all across the United States today. Mm -hmm. So Heather and I will chat out one idea to get the discussion going, but we really, really were hoping to make this somewhat of an interactive experience today. So Susan has just beautifully demonstrated the chat. She chatted out communication, yes. And we can break that down even a little bit more maybe by um, thinking about during the debriefing, maybe we ask uh, a, a fellow student or the teacher for, clarification we're asking clarifying questions if there was something we didn't understand or if we wanted to explore a point that someone was making so communication is definitely uh, a skill that would be built up by doing this activity and when you say communication stephanie it just makes me think there's all sorts of communication there's verbal communication that we can do speaking or you could have your students be doing written communication in responding in a written format so there's many different aspects of those soft skills communication found in this lesson mm -hmm. and if we could just get a few more people who are feeling 
uh, brave and who would be willing to use the chat box, we would really appreciate that. We will pause for another 30 seconds or so, but it would, it, this webinar will, I think it will, we'll all get more out of it if people are willing to share their expertise as well. So we'll pause for a moment. People are probably thinking, can we show the list of professional skills? Sure, we, that's a great idea, Susan. We will go back to that, no problem. Oops, oh, here we are. So in our TIF or our Transitions Integration Framework that we use here in Minnesota, we have effective communication, we have learning strategies, critical thinking, self-management, developing a future pathway and navigating systems. Oh, and we were just informed that people are not using the chat box, they're using the questions box. So this is a learning curve for us. We've used a different version of GoTo in the, in the past, and so questions are a little different. Ooh, that's great. Okay, so- We've got growth mindset, <laughs> Stephanie. We're, there you go. We're sorry for not addressing these. Will the slides from the webinar be available for download? That is a, maybe a question for our tech host today. Um, our emails, I believe, will be made available to you. You can always contact us. I, I can also write those right now, and um, we would be more than happy to send people the slides if they need them. They're not part of the handouts now, but I think it, we can definitely figure out a way to get them to you. Does transitions as you are using it mean transition to post-secondary education, something else, or something more inclusive? Thank you, David. Um, and that is yes. It is yes, yes, yes. It is transitioning to post-secondary. It is working on education, on employment, on training. It's just transitioning to the next step in our learners' pathways. And I can say for our transitions integration framework, the one we developed here in Minnesota, we give ideas for developing these skills for learners who are transitioning into three different areas. We have work or employment, education and training. And then the third is just community because we know for some of our students, what they want to do is transition maybe to not using a translator or interpreter when they go to the doctor, or they want to transition to being more independent when they go to those teacher student con parent teacher conferences for their children. Or maybe they want to transition into a role where they're able to volunteer in their community and they're improving their English. So we do use transitions broadly to mean whatever, whatever skills are going to help students reach their next steps that are aligned with their goals. It makes me think a lot of what the IEL civics grants are um, and the IET. It's working a lot on bringing those civic responsibilities and civic minded ideas into our learners. Okay. Mm -hmm. So a couple more questions. So someone uh, chatted out critical thinking as one of the skills that would uh, possibly be addressed through watching that video. Yes, especially I think those debrief questions um, would involve some critical thinking. And then effective communication, critical thinking, thinking. soft skills. Yes, Thank very, you, very good, Patricia. Some of the other skills that Heather and I had identified might involve um, using strategies to comprehend. So during the video, there might be some vocabulary, terminology that students were not familiar with. So what kind of strategies do you have when you're listening or reading something to help you cope with unknown words, for example, and then knowing when to employ those strategies? Kind of related to that is the idea of monitoring your comprehension. So as I'm watching that video, as I'm engaging in this, this debrief conversation, am I tracking and following what people are talking about? Could I identify the main idea of this discussion? And training our students to be asking those questions is definitely a transition skill. Another thing that you might want to think about are students could be making predictions about what could happen next. Um, we can also focus on some basic academic skills. 
which um, is using context clues or working on main idea. So again, this framework that we have here, the graphic organizer, is a way for you to use it in your lesson planning. And when you look at a lesson to focus on what are those professional soft skills that I want to bring into my lesson and maybe highlight. Mm -hmm. All right. So we have just unpacked the first part of this lesson about growth mindset. And we're going to move on to part two. Pardon? Part two involves a personal discussion. So the second part of this lesson involves sharing a personal story about a time you had to work hard to get better at something. We would like all of you or some of you who would be willing to participate now to use the, that question box or that chat box on, on my screen, the chat box is at the bottom of the list of tools on your control panel under the handouts. If you want to continue using the question, the question feature, that also is fine now that we know it's there. We're asking if you would mind chatting out briefly, a very set up for us a very brief uh, personal story about a time when you had to work hard to get better at something. So we're going to share a few of these, and then we're also thinking about going back to our graphic organizer here. What skills, what basic, or sorry, what softer professional skills would be developed in our learners by sharing and reflecting on a time when they had to work hard to get better at something? And I think Heather has a great story she wants to share about a time she had to work hard to get better at something. Oh, Stephanie, I've had to do so much to work better to get better, to, um, to use my growth mindset to get better at something. But I will share with you guys, here in Minnesota, we have a large state fair, and every year people are allowed to enter in products that they might make at home, like canned goods or baked goods. And I like to think that I make some really gosh darn great salsa. So I can my salsa and this is going to be my fifth year, yes, fifth year of me entering in my salsa in three different categories and hoping that I win a prize or a, a blue ribbon, should it be. But every year I get feedback from the judges on what I could do to make my salsa better or maybe more palatable to the judges um, Midwestern palettes, perhaps, but um, that is my growth mindset, and I am persisting, and I'm growing, and I'm changing, and I feel that, yes, one day I am going to be that blue ribbon, ribbon uh, salsa. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I know, Heather, now you've told me you've adjusted some of the, the, the ways that you prepared this salsa, so you've added more or less salt, hoping to to change the flavor you've peeled and unpeeled some of the tomatillos that you use yes. right and i've also had to change just the the name of the salsa itself so that it reflects exactly what's in there that was one of the judges um feedback comments okay. so all of that is helping me to grow that growth mindset of yes i can produce some pretty gosh darn good salsa wonderful so while you maybe some of you think of your own stories i will uh I will read out a few more uh, of the skills that people say that they think we would work on from the video and the debrief. I see Sandra really got into her TIFF, I think, and was able to identify some of our learning strategies, both by skill and sub-skill. Um, someone mentioned taking turns when having a group conversation. Ooh, that's great. I lots like that. of critical thinking, lots and lots of critical thinking. Someone asked about the chat box. It is on my screen at the bottom again of your control panel. It's okay to keep using questions. Um, we just, uh, this is just new for us. So we are, we are learning as well. Seeing failure as a learning experience. Now I'm thinking this might be in, in relation to this new part two, the personal discussion. What would you learn from sharing these stories? Seeing failure as a learning experience is so important, and that's a wonderful opportunity, uh, something that we should all keep in mind and model with our learners, is this idea that um, 
when we it's when we don't succeed at something that the most learning takes place. I have another, um, we have, if they self-reflect, they can develop analysis and self-awareness. Yes, knowing yourself as a learner and knowing how you get better at something, those are super important skills for moving forward and reaching our goals. And I think having a debrief so that the students feel comfortable in a classroom, they can share this productive struggle and maybe some faces of adversity, um, but in a, in a safe environment. It's always important to make sure the students feel safe and uh, empowered to share their challenges. Okay, so now, now I think I'm seeing a few other personal stories. A woman named Amber says, in college I thought I was a good writer until my first English 101 teacher marked up my first paper in all red. I'm sure we've all had experiences like that. I had to work hard to learn how to play Rhapsody in Blue on the piano, says Patty. Oh, well, Patty, I bet you play a, a really wonderful version of that now. Another one of our participants said, I had to buy a grammar book and go to the writing tutoring center for every paper through my first year in college. Um, okay, so uh, Kay is saying she thinks that it's not maybe not possible for everyone to be able to see all of these questions and comments. So Heather and I will do our best to keep reading them out loud. Um, and we appreciate people sticking with this, even though there's a few bumps in the road here. We're making our own productive struggle. <laughs> Dan says, learning to run a marathon. My goodness, that would certainly be something that was difficult to learn. Go, Dan, go. Um, so we have, it was difficult to learn to use the Canvas online classroom program. Each time there was a problem, I would have to figure it out by trial and error or ask for tech help, but now it's much easier. Yes, so asking for help, knowing what, where to go to get that assistance is certainly something we need to help our students understand. And within our TIF framework, that would be navigating systems. So understanding that hierarchy, who do you go to to turn for help, really an important skill. And I think this might be a friend of ours from Minnesota named Melissa said that her challenge came from attending college as a single mother. For myself, that would be working full time as a single mother is uh, something that I've had to learn to get better at, work hard to get better at in the past few years. Um, another, we, I'm taking a pre-Kelp class now. I always thought I was bad at math. I'm challenging myself now to continue with math even when it is difficult. We might not use the word difficult. We like to use the word complex because difficult, I think sometimes people might think that that would be that fixed mindset. But if you think about complex, you're learning the complexities and the different layers. And I think you're going to be a fantastic math student. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing so much of your own productive struggles. Yes. A few other um, ideas of skills. Uh, most of these um, you have someone, some of you have already identified, but lots of critical thinking, lots of problem solving. Um, another one, seeking feedback on one's performance and then thinking of ways to implement that feedback is a softer professional skill. And also goal setting and then monitoring one's progress towards that goal would play into this idea of working hard to get better at something. Okay, so thank you for sharing all of the skills that you identified, but also your own personal stories. It really makes for a much more engaging and lively webinar. So thank you. We'll move to the next part of this lesson. Again, it is a three-part lesson that you can download from the Growth Mindset uh, lesson plan that we have in the handouts. And this third part is a letter to a future student. And again, you would probably modify this to meet the needs of your learners in your classroom, but this is asking the students to write a letter to a future student. In this case, you could ask them for, to write a letter uh, to a student coming in the next quarter, the next year, the next level. But you're asking the students to reflect on the times of struggle and perseverance. So again, it's piggybacking off, in what we, off of what we just did with that oral debriefing, and now they're putting it onto paper. So on your skills identification chart, we would like you to choose a different professional skill that you didn't share just now with the 
part two of the lesson and that you think that the students might be practicing by doing this writing activity. Mm -hmm. We'd also like to show you an example that Stephanie has used in her writing classes, and I've heard of different ways that it's been modified within different environments. Mm -hmm. But again, we'd like to have you look at your graphic organizer to determine the different professional skills or soft skills that you might get out of this part of the lesson. And I'll apologize, I know this is a lot of text for you to be looking at right now. These were the actual directions that I gave to my students for doing this assignment. We use in our program a learning management system called Schoology. It's a free platform that allows teachers to set up classes and uh, organize resources and materials, set up discussion boards, receive assignments, share links, all of those kinds of things. So it's similar to something like D2L or Blackboard. And again, that's called Schoology. And so for this assignment, I used Schoology, and th these were the directions I gave to my students. I adapted this assignment just a little bit. Rather than writing a letter to a future student other than oneself, I had my students write a letter to their future self. I asked them to think about a time in the future when they had reached their goals. I said, imagine yourself six months, a year, two years in the future. At that time, you've reached your goal and you are looking back over some of the challenges and obstacles that you have faced. And you're going to describe what the obstacles were and also what strategies you used to overcome them. Then I told the students we would keep these letters and in the future we'd be able to use them during times when we might need some motivation or encouragement. At the bottom in the third paragraph that you see on your screen, it talks a little bit about some, some editing when you finish the letter, what to do as far as making sure it is ready to turn in to me. And I'll talk more about that in just a moment. So for right now, you're just thinking about this idea of writing a letter to a future student or to your future self. And I will show you an example of what one of my students responded when we did this assignment. So here's an example of a student response. And um, I will read this out. So I took the name out just for the sake of privacy. So we can say, dear self, I would like to commend me on coming back to school after four years in 2014. So a little background, this student had taken the, the older version of the GED. She had passed four out of five tests. And before she could pass the math, the test changed, and of course her scores became invalid. So for her to come back to school, she carried forward a lot of disappointment and frustration about the fact that she had not earned her GED before the test changed. So she writes, I want to earn my GED and graduate. I know it was difficult for me to start all over again and passing the tests that I had already passed, which were all of them except for math. Now they have it where if I don't pass in the time allowed, I would have to do them all over again. I was very upset when Adrian told me this, so I quit. One day I was home sitting on my couch looking out the window deep in thought of what I should do now that I'm disabled and can't work full time. I thought about doing daycare, but due to my back issues, what wouldn't have worked out well? I was diagnosed as having degenerative disc disease, which is arthritis in the spine, which prevents me from most mobility. So I made the decision on going back to school and studying on getting my GED and graduate. When I got here at Minneapolis Public Schools and while doing the assignments, I couldn't quite understand the writing, the comprehension of the reading and the math. That frustration voice kept telling me to quit. However, I kept talking with my children, grandchildren, friends on Facebook, and mostly God, and praying. All encouraged me to stay in school. It's been hard, but I'm still here. I had took one of the tests, and that was the RLA test, and my score was not high enough to pass. Ugh, that made me want to quit again. 
but I overcame again and stayed. This is one goal I am determined to finish with the Lord's strength, stature, and wisdom. With all God's people, I will endure this goal that I have set for me to accomplish. So this is a, this is a pretty authentic letter from an actual learner. And this is something that uh, she, she wrote and she is still in our program. She is still working. So this was her example of something that might give her motivation in the future. I see so much identification of a growth mindset of her stamina, her persistence. She just really continues on making sure she gets her goal of a GED. Now I have had other people comment that they do something similar to this where the students are writing a letter to themselves in the future and teachers have actually taken that letter, addressed it to the learners and then perhaps over a winter break or a Thanksgiving break, mailed it out to the learners so that the learners will receive it a few months later. It's a great way to have the students connect with themselves and their goals and I think it's a wonderful reminder of why our students are here in the first place they want to move on they want to transition mm -hmm. as far as the skills um, someone used developing a future pathway one of our categories from the TIF I think that's right especially if the student writes about linking what their future pathway is back to why they need to reach these goals and that kind of reflection definitely helps us to see ourselves in the future. Um, skills on the letter organization works for both basic academic and professional skills. Yes, so a lot of this letter we can find both the professional skills and the basic skills. So the basic skills would come into play with the mechanics, the organization, the grammar and language. The, the professional or soft skills would come into play with, I think, the reflection and the preparing for what to write. And I think earlier someone had uh, mentioned self-awareness. So I think that also is that professional or soft skill that students are aware of their learning processes. Mm -hmm. I love this response. The, the person wrote, if writing to another student, they are empathizing or seeing things from another's point of view, which is a crucial soft skill, yes. Empathy is such an important skill and it is one of those skills that is cross cross context. So in the workplace, almost every field you go into would be needing um, empathy skills. So that is a great one to bring up and this is a great way to work on that. And I think um, also having that debrief with students that can be empathizing with your colleagues upon that productive struggle. And I love that people are starting to get into the different boxes. Yes, digital literacy skills for sure. If you were going to be typing this letter and then formatting it perhaps, you would definitely get into some digital literacy skills. And if you didn't think along those lines, that's a way to really make this a very well-rounded um, skill lesson so that you can be incorporating these other skills that we might overlook at times. Mm -hmm. So some other ideas Heather and I had. Um, one that wasn't mentioned before might be understanding expectations and norms. So in order to overcome a struggle, the struggle might be that you're not understanding exactly how to fit in or what's expected, expected of you. So understanding what those norms are. And then also knowing how to utilize and leverage resources is an important skill for our students to have. Okay, so thank you guys very much for sharing your ideas and also using this skills identification chart because as we say, we use this for ourselves to help make very productive lessons that incorporate many different skills. And again, this lesson and the ideas that we're presenting are definitely things that you can take, modify, adapt for your own learners. So we're hoping you're getting some ideas here for things you could try in the classroom. So now I'm gonna get back to that third part of the directions that were in my original letter, and we'll see that again in just a moment. And we're gonna talk a little bit about strategy instruction, which is another way, uh, in addition to making sure that your lesson covers more than one skill set so that it's integrated, using strategy instruction is a great way to help get more out of your lessons and units. So when we talk about strategy instruction, we've got kind of three, three ideas here. One is learning task formats. 
Learning task formats are routine structures for activities and tasks that provide practice of lesson content. The idea of a learning task format is that the format stays the same. It could be a graphic organizer, it could be the way you, you do a dictation, it could be a partner sharing activity. Students become familiar with the format and then the specific content can change. The content can actually become more difficult because the students are comfortable and used to the task. So the task is not a barrier and that allows us to up the rigor of our content. Some examples of these learning task formats that I use in my classroom is I use a graphic organizer for academic vocabulary instruction. I also have a learning task format built into the learning management system that we use here in our program and that's Schoology. So students are used to it. It's not a learning, uh, the, how do I want to say it? They don't have to focus on learning how to use the format. They're focusing on learning the content. So within Schoology, they're focused on learning and reading and not focused so much on using those digital literacy skills. That almost becomes background for them and they are practicing the content of the lesson. In particularly, students who maybe have barriers to academic success, um, it could be just baggage from past educational experiences. It could be because they have a lack of experience with formal education. Setting up learning task formats that you use again and again, so that's our second point, making them routine, helps your students to feel more comfortable in the classroom. It kind of lowers some of those uh, obstacles about like not knowing what to expect, worrying that they're going to do it wrong. When those walls come down, students actually learn better. So making your learning task formats routine, like Heather said, using the same graphic organizer every time you read a new text, for example, helps our students to perform better. And then the third point, Creating norms, so if our students learn something like a, a way to take notes by using a particular task format or a, a method for remembering vocabulary, then they're able to make that a routine. And then if they carry that into their life outside of your classroom, that's when it becomes a norm. When your students kind of internalize it, maybe they're reading the newspaper, maybe they're at work and they're going through some training materials, and they're able to employ, employ some of those learning task formats that you've taught them to help them learn and master that new content, that's when it becomes a norm. So these three things, learning task formats, routines, and norms, really work together to help our students be more successful learners. And Stephanie, you uh, remind me of something that happened with uh, conferencing with my students at the end of the last quarter, is students in my class, we have a routine of always highlighting the main idea in a passage, and the students tell me that they do this when they receive training materials from their work now, so they're highlighting the most important or that main idea within the materials. That's crossing over to that transition skills, and it's helping them in many areas of their life and not just in the classroom. Excellent, so I'm gonna come back now, bring it back around to our letter, and I'd like to direct your attention to the third paragraph, if you will, in these directions, where it says, please take your time and be thoughtful when you write this letter. When you finish it, please read what you have written and try to check for mistakes in your writing. Here's the part where we talk about our routine and our learning task format. You can use the same editing process that we use in class when we do our warm-up activity of correcting the 10 mistakes in a paragraph. Remember to think about cups. So cups is a mnemonic that I have taught my students that helps them with editing. CUP stands for capital letters, usage and grammar, punctuation and spelling. So the strategy that I want is for that I want my students to take away is for them to have this mnemonic in their minds when they look for mistakes in their own writing. That's that's what I'm trying to encourage them to do. That's the strategy that's going to help them be better writers. But to practice that, 
we use this website and the website, this comes from a website called Everyday Edits. And it comes from the education world is the larger website. And the Everyday Edits section is where we get these paragraphs. On the website, Everyday Edits, you can literally find one of these paragraph correction activities for, there's one for every day of every month. So it's broken into 12 months, and then within each month, there is a different paragraph for every day of that month, plus some bonus material. So the, the actual paragraph correction is an example of a learning task format. It is a learning task format because the students become familiar with the task, which is looking for the 10 mistakes. They're able to practice the strategy of cups because if you look in the directions, they're directed to look for capitalization errors, usage and grammar errors, punctuation and spelling. So these paragraphs are actually a vehicle or a way for them to practice that skill. This particular one, Women's History Month, you should be able to have this from, this should be your last handouts from our handouts tab. Everyday Edits Women's History Month. So if you have that, you could quickly, we'll spend about a minute or two having you look at it to identify the mistakes. There are 10 mistakes. We'll give you about a minute to see how many you can find, and then we will show you the answers. So we'll pause for just a minute to give people a chance to find the 10 mistakes in this paragraph. Okay, so we hope that's been enough time for you to have a look at this and to find some of these mistakes. I'm gonna advance and you can see the errors here. Now I will point out that there are 10 errors. However, on your screen, it is only showing nine of the 10 errors. So I'd like to see if anyone can find the secret elusive number 10 that it does not appear on your screen in the moment. You can see that the green are the corrections that we would want our students to name. I actually, in my class, I tell them they have to find the mistake, they have to name the mistake, and then fix it. That's right, I was just gonna say, a great routine for going over and using these paragraphs in your classroom is to follow the, the steps of find it, name it, fix it. So it's not, I tell my students, it's not just about underlining or circling where the mistake is. We have a group discussion about what is that mistake? Is it a missing comma? Is it a missing apostrophe? Is it a misspelled word? Is it uh, something should not be plural, subject verb agreement? And then we also fix it. So find it, name it, fix it is our routine for doing this. You can see there is a capitalization mistake in the first line. The word achievement was missing a letter, I believe, in the second line. So that would be the spelling error. That's correct. We had a mistake with um, woman and women in the third line and so on. So there are 10 mistakes. The 10th mistake happens in the second line where in the original it was on March comma 19 comma 1911 of course the comma after March would not be correct so that that is taken out again this is a wonderful free resource you don't even have to create a user account in order to access these 
paragraphs. If the paragraphs seem a bit too high level for your learners, taking any sort of text, maybe stories that you read, and deliberately mixing up or messing up a few of the sentences, thinking about the cups, capitalization, usage and grammar, punctuation and spelling, you can still make this a routine that you use. I see that some people were, one of our friends, Nellie, did find the March 19th error, and people were pointing out other, other errors as well, capitalization errors, punctuation errors, so thank you for participating. And it's a great instructional strategy that you can be using in your classroom. And again, you're just trying to get, get the most out of your lesson. You're incorporating those professional skills, but you're giving students an opportunity through routines and a learning format and then taking those into norms that they will carry this out and they'll always be thinking, I need to make sure I have a capital letter. I'm using the words correctly. I'm spelling them and I have proper punctuation. That's right. I don't know about your learners, but if I just ask my students to look for mistakes in their own writing, it is difficult for them. Obviously, they don't set out to include errors in their writing, and if you're not aware you're making errors, then it can be hard to find them. So giving them something like the CUPS strategy, and there are other editing mnemonics. There is COPS, the changing the U to an O, which then uh, directs our attention on organization instead of usage. There is stops, for example. So there are different ways, uh, there are different variations on this. All of them help to support strategy instruction, which again can be recognized as an approach that teaches the tools and techniques necessary for understanding learning and retaining new content and skills. The goal of strategy instruction is that learners use the tools independently when they get stuck or need help. It's developing that growth mindset. So instead of just giving up and throwing their pen across the table, they're actually gonna be using these strategies to carry on and they haven't finished it yet, but they will get done with it. Okay, so we are gonna pause for just maybe a minute or two, because I know it's getting close to time. We were hoping that some of you wonderful participants might be willing to use your chat or question box to share an example from your classroom of a learning task format or a routine or a norm. Things that you're doing in your classes to help, to help develop strategy instruction with your students. So different learning task formats, routines, or norms that you are using. If you could share those, you've been wonderfully active participants today, and we would love to, to hear a few of your ideas. We'll, we'll pause for about 30 seconds to let the sharing happen, and then we'll continue. Okay, so I see that one of our participants has identified Quizlet as a learning task. Yes, so Quizlet, I believe, is an online uh, tool that allows, allows teachers or users to set up quizzes that their students can do in a, a lab setting or using a, using a computer. So that's a wonderful example. Thank you for that. I know that some people have brought that idea of Quizlet into the smartphone and they might use something called Kahoot. So mm -hmm. let us know if you have any familiarity with that. In fact, that's a great one. Patricia just chatted oh. out Kahoot, Heather. Oh, there you go. One I've never heard of that I'm gonna write down is, is the idea of doing a cocktail hour where students practice conversation with questions. You know, I think that's great in calling it cocktail hour. I'm assuming that's kind of just the, the name that you've given this practice. But yeah, I mean, in many professional situations, people are expected to be able to make small talk, and I think that's a great routine to get into. Oh, yeah, we have the chit chat right there. We've it's got other talk. ideas here, um, five sentence dictation, 
that practices vocabulary, yes. I sometimes do that with partners, partner dictation. Our friend Laura Smith-Hill from uh, South Dakota, hi Laura, uh, mentioned Venn diagrams, thanks for that. Reciprocal teaching, the fasting strategy that increases reading levels by one to two levels each year. Wow, that's amazing. We have a uh, dictation Thursday, Kahoot Friday, doing different mix and mingles. Online classroom has provided a format that becomes familiar for the students with content changing daily and weekly. There is your learning task format. Thank you for sharing that. And it really is helpful in students overcoming those obstacles and learning the content. So these are great ideas that you guys are sharing. We really appreciate it. This is how we learn from each other. A couple more gym kit, or maybe that's gym kit, G-I-M-K-I-T is something similar to Kahoot. We've not tried that. Someone says, I serve drinks, non-alcoholic. Maybe that's for cocktail hour. That sounds like so much fun. Um, w8 questions, how was your weekend? Um, ABC order, that's a wonderful one for vocabulary words that practices our critical thinking skills of sorting and ordering. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing. You can keep chatting out and we're going to get back and finish up our slides here. So we have not talked too much. Some people have brought up the, nor the digital literacy skills and we said earlier we'd be showing you a resource, a, uh, a set of tools that you can use for digital literacy. And these were developed in Minnesota by our, our some partner um, a partner consortium in St. Paul, I believe. And these are called the North Star Digital Literacy Standards. So these standards are in eight or nine modules. You can see them listed here on the screen. Basic computer skills, World Wide Web, Windows, Mac, email, Word, social media, Excel, PowerPoint, information, literacy. And these are great um, skills and assessments. You can go to the North Star Digital Literacy website and you could have your students take assessments and they can be then progressing and learning these skills needed within digital literacy. There's also some great lessons that uh, are applicable for each of these standards that were developed by the St. Paul Public Library and they have online learning for students to be learning about these digital literacy skills. So it's a great tool and it's a way for you to be bringing in those digital literacy skills that are so needed for all levels of transitioning to the workplace, to post-secondary, to training, and even working in the community today. Students have to work with their uh, the, the teachers of their children, um, they have to go online and they have to do their time cards. So they need to do all sorts of work online using digital literacy. Absolutely everything. So some of you already pointed out about our letter writing activity. You would be using maybe Word to create that letter. In our program, we use Google Drive so that it's cloud-based. So then that would be using the World Wide Web. Some people might be doing slides, so that could be PowerPoint. Um, there's also Excel. But that one, the last category, is somewhat new for the North Star Digital Literacy Standards, and that's information literacy. And that's actually focusing in on those ideas of bias when doing online research and getting some of those more standards and skills that you might use in a collegiate setting. Okay, so we are going to look again at that third part of the lesson. So remember that's writing a letter to your future self or a future student. This is the part that requires students to do writing. So the other parts are more about thinking, reflecting. Here we're doing a writing assignment. So we're gonna ask you to think about the basic skills and the digital literacy skills that your students would need to successfully complete this part of the lesson. And we'll ask you if you can share some of those ideas. Um, we have one more um, learning task format that was shared. That's a jigsaw activity. That's a great one where you break up a larger piece of text among different groups of students. So now we're going to 
think about that writing piece and what types of basic skills would be supported through doing a writing activity such as creating a letter if people would share a few ideas we will read them out and again you can be using the graphic organizer for the skills identification chart and this time you can be filling in the basic skills area which is the top right hand part of your form of your graphic organizer Okay, some of the ideas Heather and I have come up with. Someone else mentioned before organization. Yes, making sure your letter flows logically with some sort of an organizational pattern. Um, maybe most, um, most important idea to least important or something like that. Um, there is also the idea of summarizing. Heather was thinking if a student is recounting a difficult time in their life, it, they, you know, it might become disorganized to share every single detail. So how can we succinctly and clearly explain what the problem was through using a summarizing techniques? Um, vocabulary, thinking about your audience and your task and choosing the appropriate vocabulary would be another possible professional, or excuse me, basic skill. Some other ideas that have come rolling in, spelling, sentence and paragraph structure right so just do we have correct sentences and not fragments and run-ons and Liz, leslie also agrees with us with vocabulary thank you for sharing typing skills which yes. can be some of those basic skills especially in today's workplace yes or also digital literacy, literacy skills yeah. of course writing convention so even just making sure your students are using correct capitalization and ending punctuation would be important here. And then summary and analysis, as we had mentioned as well. So we have uh, addressed definitely our top two boxes. And then if we think more about the digital literacy here, again, these are those standards. These are the different modules. There are um, several. The, they are available um, to be downloaded and they are included on our resource list that we will be showing you at the end of the webinar. And each of the standards have sub skills. So within computer, basic computer skills, I believe there are 29 different sub skills within that. And so your learners might be at various levels, but it's a good way to uh, begin their assessment. And using North Star, they're able to earn a certificate. Yes, which can be such an important thing and even just, I think, something to bolster confidence going to uh, interview and someone asks you about um, having learned something, uh, learning a new skill. How did you learn a new skill? Students are able to say, I actually earned this certificate and here's how I earned it. How empowering is that for our learners? And that's a growth mindset. Um, some other skills, some academic skills, social register, yes, so keeping in mind audience, purpose, and tone are very important. Um, from the brain lesson, someone brought in learning to interpret pictures and describe them. Right, for our low-level learners sometimes, or even just learners from a very different um, cultural background, looking at pictures of something and thinking about how they represent ideas and concepts and objects in the world can be difficult and using videos is a great way to talk about that. So again, what you're seeing right now are the complete breakdown of the skills from the Microsoft Word module in North Star Digital Literacy. Which of these do we think someone typing a letter would be using? Which of these skills? I'll keep these skills up on the screen and you can let us know which ones you think would be identified. If you want, you can just type in the number of the skill to save time. And again, you would be using your skills identification chart and you'd be using the square in the lower left-hand corner where it says digital literacy skills. So again, for typing this letter, which ones do you think students would be uh, using within this lesson? And we, we don't have any responses just yet. Maybe people are kind of catching up, looking at the skills. Um, 
the first one, I think real obvious would be opening a new or existing document. So skill one, um, Leslie typed out, she chatted out skill three, skill 10, skill 14 and skill 16. Oh, great. I yes. agree. Those are what we had as well, Leslie. We have a lot of responses now. We also have skill seven, skill one, five, seven, and 10, aligning text, skills 11, 12, and five. So really, I think depending on the level of detail, depending on your instructions, the level of your students, you could use almost all of these. I'm not 100% sure about the bullets. That might not do as well with this particular example, but almost all the rest, I think, are definitely doable things you could cover. And for me, number 10, use the undo button. To me, I tell students that's the best button that they have. It's going to be their best friend, undo. Okay, so we have now covered most of our boxes here, most of our bases for building that lesson. In the time that we have left, which is just a few minutes, we did want to share a few resources with you. You have been so active on the chat. I think we're going to skip that. And instead, we want to let you know, I mentioned at the very beginning of this webinar that there is a resource library to help support those TIF skills, our Transitions Integration Framework. These are on our Atlas website. Atlas is our PD delivery system in Minnesota. It stands for ABE Teaching and Learning Advancement System. The website is atlasabe.org. If you go under resources, where the arrow in the picture is pointing, you can see our online library. And the one that you would choose is ACES TIFF Resources. In that library, there are full lesson plans at several levels, at a beginning, intermediate, and advanced levels that can be downloaded for you to use for teaching these skills. There are a variety of different online resources that are divided by each of the six categories. Everything here has been vetted and has been tried, and it is an excellent place, sort of a one-stop shop to go to for finding transitions resources. And again, these are all free. You can just click and download these lessons, and you can take and use them. We really feel that sharing is one of the unique features in adult basic education. We share very well, and we collaborate with our colleagues all across the United States. Mm -hmm. So here is our reference list. Um, we do hope there is a way, maybe at the end one of our tech hosts could jump on or Susan could let us know. If you definitely, if you come into our moderated discussion within the community of practice hosted through links in the teaching and learning chat room, we can post our slides for people to download. We can share more resources. We can share our contact information. For right now, taking a picture of this reference list might be a good strategy you could use. Or a screenshot, um, different ways. You could also send us a quick email. We're more than happy to share all of this. Can you please repeat the address of that website? I think oh, she is means it Atlas. Yes, yeah. it is the one, two, three, four. It is the fifth. Thing you're seeing on your screen where it says aces slash tiff atlas abe.org slash professional slash transitions that is our website again we will make sure we post all of these resources and more share all of these resources in our moderated discussion okay so that is all of our content for today we want to thank you. You really, really did a wonderful job participating. You made this fun for us. This is our first time doing a webinar for links, and so it's been a great experience. Thank you, Susan, for working with us to, to build this and bring it, bring it to a larger audience. Yes, and I would like to reiter reiterate thank you to everyone involved, but I also want you guys to know that this collaborative um, adventure only works when you guys give us feedback. So we would like to really invite you to complete the survey. And this is the website that Lynx has given us for the survey. But we would like you guys to also join us in the community uh, 
Lynx community for further discussion and you can share more of what you are doing in your classroom and sharing it with colleagues around the United States. And we have just finished our time. So everyone's saying thank you. Thank you guys very much for joining us. Thank you so much, Stephanie and Heather. It was a wonderful presentation. And this is Susan Finn Miller. I am the moderator for the Teaching and Learning Community on Lynx where we will continue our discussion and continue the wonderful sharing and collaborating that has happened this afternoon. So we invite everybody to join us there and um, have more opportunity to go deeper and the sharing of more resources throughout the rest of this week. So that'll be on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So we welcome you to come. And once again, uh, thanks to everyone for participating today. And thank you especially to our presenters, Stephanie Summers and Heather Turngren. Thank you, Susan. Real quickly, we noticed a question about someone said they couldn't download the handouts. Again, we, we hope we can get those to you if you join us in our discussion. So any anything like that, we are more than willing to work with you to get things distributed.